Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me make sure I'm all going here. Cha cha cha. <clears throat> okay. And you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah, I hear you fine. Gro groovy. All right. For the radio audience, can you please tell us who you are, where you are right now, and what you're attempting to do with your art? Ooh. Uh, I'm Iris DeMent. I'm in Iowa City, Iowa. Hmm. Let's just dive right in. What am I attempting to do with my art? Um, well, I'm attempting to make the world a better place. Uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds a little trite, doesn't it? But that is what I'm attempting to do. That's one of the many things I'm attempting to do. Um, one of the, the places it starts for me is usually attempting to solve a problem for myself, uh, either an emotional one or one, uh, you know, where I'm uh -huh. trying to understand something outside of me a little bit better. Um, I'm trying to... Um, place myself in the human community a little bit better and music has a um a knack for that wouldn't you say it's one a would good hope vehicle. it's a good vehicle for that um yeah i'm trying to do those things and more i mean uh, i know for me music's been very healing and sustaining so i'm trying to provide that to others and myself at the same time. There's probably five other things I'm trying to do, but those are the key ones. Well, I feel like we've forgotten as music listeners and song uh, consumers that protest music is a part of the American uh, discourse, right? That it's like something that is deeply ingrained in, I think, the uh, bedrock of what American music is. And I feel like mainstream music, especially country music, is so far out of uh, that realm that we almost forget how powerful uh, songs that can stick a needle in the side of evil can be, you know? I like how you put that. Mm -hmm. And this new record... Uh, working on a world which comes out as we speak uh, next week. Very exciting. Um, you know, you're diving into the stories of obviously Martin Luther King Jr., Mahalia Jackson, John Lewis, social justice warriors that had to push this huge rock up a endless hill. Do you feel like as a songwriter who's been working, you know, 30 plus years that you are also pushing a rock in, in a similar way, or is it a totally different practice? Well, I feel like just to live to an extent um, is something it involves pushing a rock, you know? I mean, life, even the best of circumstances, you know, it requires a, a lot of us. So there's that to start with. But certainly um, the state of the world is pretty harsh and bleak and troubling at the moment. So just to move forward in it and to not surrender to it. It, it, it is, yes, it involves um, something akin to your description. Yes. And uh, gathering the will and the determination to make this record involved that for me, because there was a period of time, you know, around, oh, started, I guess, late the year in 2016, you know, um, like so many people that, you know, were tuned in and and had uh, the ability to recognize danger when it's heading towards them, you know, I was very discouraged, to put it mildly. So, yeah, I had to muster, dig down deep, muster up something to keep me going, and I poured all of that into these songs. And Well... The title track, you know, has this refrain that, you know, I don't have all the answers to the troubles of the day. Neither did all our ancestors and they persevered anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think the 
hardest thing to recognize as, you know, fellow artists or something who are trying to bend the arc of progress the right way mm-hmm. is that there is this constant uh, backslide, right? Where there's two steps forward, one huge step back. Mm-hmm. And that seems to happen throughout American history, especially coming out of the Civil War, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil mm-hmm. rights movement, and then it's like Reaganomics. And that's you know, like every time we think we're going somewhere, we go backwards and then we go a little bit forwards and then we go way backwards. And then we go, a little, you know, um, how has it felt for you um, as a songwriter who's been in the trenches, you know, since what the Bush first Bush era is probably when you've put out that debut yeah. record. Well, um, my first record came out in 92, but uh, in 96, I think it was around the Bush era. Yes. I put out an album that had some political songs, Wasteland of the Free. And there's a wall in Washington. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's when um, that turn was taken. I mean, not saying that uh, it doesn't um, take, well, I am saying that it does take some courage to be openly political as a, a songwriter who's trying to sell music. I mean, you had those records on more or less major labels, you know, in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Was there pushback when you tried to be openly uh, political in your songs that early? No, um, I had surprisingly little if any pushback um, in the years of my record making, even with, um, I mean, for the last few records, I put my records out on my own label. But prior to that, as you said, I was on Rounder and the Warner Brothers. And um, it's not what you would expect, but I had a team of people around me that totally supported me in doing what I wanted to do. And I had made that clear when I went with them and they, they abided by their commitment. All those people are fired. <laughs> I don't think yeah. any of them God rest him. Are there anymore. <laughs> the rest of them left. They, I think they saw the right on the wall and left, but, and then, you know, I got out of there, but um, no, I am fortunate that I could say that that never got in my way um, or maybe not fortunate. I don't know, but I, I wrote the songs I wanted to write and I, put out you know records the way that i wanted them to be and so could you imagine the way i should that record released in 96 having a song like wasteland of the free coming out on some sort of major label now i i i can't imagine it you know are there any major labels i don't even i am (laughs) so out of the label that was an honest question i really don't know i I just don't pay attention there are a few okay um yeah, you know, it is odd. You might be right about that. I mean, certainly it wouldn't come out on any major, like, um, you know, pop or country records. But how odd it is, though, that at the same time, these major labels are more than willing to put out records that say horrific things about women. I mean, really violent um the few I've come across, I I find kind of alarming what is allowable. Um, But you're probably right. That song. I mean, you start right. Coming after them, uh, you know. I mean, right in the opening lines of that song, Wasteland of Three, we're talking about these preachers, you know, that saying they're Christ's disciples, they don't look like Jesus to me. They're living in the wasteland of the free. You know, and they're talking about, about corporate cash in church. I mean, right again, but I don't see Carrie Underwood, right? Or like, uh, oh no, people who are on American Idol as the uh, new face of country, right? Okay. Uh, right? They're not talking about preachers stealing people's monies and, and and dealing in these dark politics, and yeah. I think that's. It's it's unfortunate because I think a lot of country music actually started as protest music. Sure right? did. I would agree. Yeah. And we've lost that sense that it has to be about selling trucks instead of about 
mining the conscience of our country or something you know well i mean it's not just the record industry it's the entire country it's all been driven now towards profit and profit for the very few and ever it seems to me uh, what decisions are left that aren't made on that basis you know whether it's art or cars or you you name it <laughs> the list is so long journalism you know it's all um it's just been brought down to such a low level that is um the damage from that is incalculable not just in the obvious you know that we have massive numbers of people that can't afford to feed themselves and their children and get access to basic necessities but on the spiritual level it's it's just it's killing humans it's you know, it's soul sucking and very alarming, uh, to put it mildly. But um, yeah, that's not going to happen. Court controlled media outlets, you're correct. They're not going to be um, playing songs like this. And Well, you grew up in Arkansas, one of. No, I, I grew up in California. I was born in yeah, Arkansas. Yeah. That's my true. family yes. went to California when I was very little. Yeah. Youngest of 14. Is that right? I am. Mm -hmm. Which creates its own drama, I'm sure, growing up. Um, but the Pentecostal uh, upbringing you had informs your work to this day. Um, your relationship with sort of the idea of Jesus filters in and out of a lot of your work, it seems, and the teachings yeah. that he either could give us or that people are um, misconstruing for their own profit. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a question. It's just like, I yeah, see, I see uh, the through line through your work that there's this, yes. there is a fascination, I think, with this figure as both social justice warrior and, um, token of deceit that can be used by people in power yeah you get into another highly troubling er area <laughs> um i mean i i think um if you were to ask me what i'm most concerned about today maybe next to global warming are uh you know white evangelicals um, we could call them white nationalists, but I think base and that would be accurate, but basically what they've been up to is the same today is what they've been up to for a really long time. They've just consolidated power and become really scary. Um, those folks keep me up at night and having come out of that world, I, um, I think I have a, a little bit of, you know, I don't know if it's a unique insight because a lot of people came out of that world, but um, the thought of them getting much more power than they already have, which is a lot, <laughs> they're running a lot. They're running the state I live in, you know, they're, they gave us the last president. Um, it's the fascist party now, and it's pretty terrifying. The, the place, the level of power, they have achieved. Um, so I don't, uh, I want to be clear that I, I came out of that world, but I left probably 90% of it behind. I'm very, uh, I admire the teaching. I admire what we know of Jesus. I think he got placed in the wrong book. And I expect any day now, the evangelicals will say as much because they're not very interested in that guy. He's a problem for them. <laughs> If you notice that they very very rarely mention him anymore, he's a major complication, you know, a, a, a hitch in their agenda. But um, he, you know, like so many other wise <laughs> prophets of our time, you know, um, in my opinion, was on to a pretty good thing, and I try to carry that through in my music. The other thing that I haven't let go of is. I don't know if I can even put words on it, really, but there was something that I learned about in those churches. There was something, I just call it the spirit, and I don't 
I don't feel the need to try to explain that. I don't think that's contained in anybody's religion. You can be an atheist and feel this thing I think of as spirit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with. But I was, and I give my parents a lot of credit for this. They were good, decent folks that were there for, I mean, to avoid talking about this all day, basically the right reasons. And I, I at a young age could pick up on that element of it um that soul that soulful thing that mm -hmm. humans need to connect to and i felt that when i was very tiny and I, I when you say me maintaining my connection to that i don't know how, what you're saying but for me it's that i'm mm -hmm. trying to carry that into the world minus the bs and that's only grown um well the song let me be your jesus on the new record which mm -hmm. uh you know, you wrote with your husband, Greg Brown. Um, there's there's this sort of a little uh, sort of irony poking us, I think, of, you know, don't believe what you hear. Don't believe what you see. Just listen to your savior, savior now. Only believe in me, right? Like mm -hmm. anyone strong arming you to only listen to one side um, yeah. can't really be a savior in a way, right? You know, I would even back to Jesus. I personally don't believe Jesus ever even said that. If you read, um, and you know, we don't need to talk all day about Jesus. There's lots of other guys that were yeah. very interesting too. But uh, I don't think that you know this whole you know no one gets to the Father except through me. I I, I don't. A lot of those words just don't jibe with you know the other things right. he said, and so I I just how to go with that. Um, but yes, those, those, yeah, that those are lyrics and, and my husband wrote those lyrics. I wrote the melody by the way. Um, but yeah, it uses that, um, that Christian, I don't know what you call it, directive, you know, to accept the voice of this one person as God's voice and, um, kind of taking it in an obvious direction from there again anybody that was paying attention trump all i mean he came within a hair of you know calling himself jesus and and folks in those churches related to him in that manner and so that's yeah that's what that song is that's the material that song is working with but again uh as you know uh, there's a lot of folks like that. I mean, pretty much any fascist authoritarian mm -hmm. fellow, and sadly, they are always men so far, um, could come close to fitting that. It's the fascist leader um, um, description. I heard. I heard that the uh, the far right, I think, prime minister of Italy, who's a lady right now, uh, believes that different. believes that the Lord of the Rings books are religious canon you know um yeah i had forgotten about her um <laughs> you know when you that touches on another thing i mean the the to be raised biblically is essentially to be primed for uh, conspiracy theories i mean you know to be be raised with the belief in the ark and you know the angel b rolled the stone away and you know the virgin was impregnated by god etc 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 it goes on and on i mean i was taught stories about the man swallowed by the well who had an encounter of god popped out i was taught these stories as facts and um even today sometimes i feel myself i'm still disentangling myself from that because when you are born and every grown-up around you mm. is in support of it's really it's a lot to mm. part but um oh where was i going my point was that it's a perfect marriage the evangelical christian whether you're in italy or here community with what's going on right now you're primed for conspiracy theories so yes whatever was you said the prime minister of italy's you know, it's not any more out there than um, Jesus walked on water, you know, and the Red Sea was parted. So, yeah, the trees started are, walking, you know, they're Lord perfect knows. companions. And that's really what's so 
I've always kept my mouth relatively shut about people's religions because I thought, well, that's your faith. You know, mm -hmm. you're free to your faith. But I have i don't think we have that option anymore. And I, I uh, actually feel like it's my duty now to say out loud, these are these are myths and they're really, really dangerous to us to, to just look the other way while tens of thousands of people are managing, managing their lives, you know, and their view of the world based on fiction. Um, that's a serious problem. You know what I mean? You've seen it here. We're in agreement, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> If not, let me talk some more. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. But the, uh, I think the vibe on this new record is one of uh, paying homage or giving thanks or um, sort of being thankful that you can be in a world where uh, a Martin Luther King Jr., a Mahalia Jackson, even the chicks, also known as the Dixie Chicks back in the day, can mm -hmm. exist among us you know and to put their necks on the line um and you know your epic going down to sing in texas um which feels like would fit right on one of the new bob dylan records you know just just going for it but like you know sort of paying homage to these people uh merle haggard willie nelson like those guys oh yeah if they would have stuck up for what they believed in in Texas and did did many yeah. times. who who would have cared <laughs> except that the chicks did it and then yeah. they get blackballed out of the industry for what a decade almost you know yeah um yeah. it's it's striking um and you know you've played in Texas for thirty years um obviously you you talked about the the open carry law that got passed down there and yeah it's like you see shootings and these things happen in music venues and churches and public squares all over the world how are we to feel safe as people who don't agree with those policies um when you know people can just walk in with guns on their hip at your show you know yeah it's over and that's what that song came out of in that tiny room by the way of a seats about 100 150 there's there's no getting out you know <laughs> people are closer to me on that stage as i am to you you know two feet away tops it, yeah, it was very sobering. Um, there is no feeling safe. And and it's uh, no accident that there is no feeling safe. You know, this was masterminded and hugely profitable to a small percentage of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that song, I had to decide if I was going to go hide out you know <laughs> and hang it up or if i was gonna find a way to mm -hmm. muster up the courage to move around in that world and you know we're talking about me as a folk singer children are having to muster muster up the courage every day to leave right. the house and go to school you know <laughs> that's how I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but when you pause with these things, sometimes even for a few seconds, it's very mind bending, like where we're at right now. One thing you referenced, Wasteland of the Free, there was a line in there, I think, um, where I was talking about corporate um, CEOs, profits, I think were something like 200. Mm -hmm. That was 1996. They're like upwards of a thousand, you know, times the workers pay right now, if not more. You know, I, for example, you want me to just go off the rails here? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, look, Things people come to see you, broken. the people who come to see you at the Cactus Cafe in, in, in Austin, right? Mostly probably preaching to the choir. But are there times where you feel like someone has spoken up to you or heckled you or, or 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 felt the need to disagree with you in a public way that made you uncomfortable well i i've always had i mean pretty much from the day that i start that i put out um you know the way i should and started playing some of those songs li live absolutely i would have people that would you know boo or sit down or i invariably somebody would leave during that song or 
you know, um, and I got a lot of hate mail, but that was pre social media world and pre uh, Donald Trump and, you know, pre having leadership directing people towards violence and hostility. Mm -hmm. So we're in a whole different, it's a totally different ball game right now. So it would have never entered my mind that the level of danger that exists now for all of us. And as you said earlier, myself, just as a folk singer, you know, a little club could face just by saying things uh, to speak out of conscience, you know, speak from a place of conscience, you know, you would uh, walk in the streets and confront, you know, you'd cross the Selma bridge for something like that, you know, right. You'd, and now it's crossed over to a whole different level. Um, but yeah, that song for me was um, my decision to, I, I just have to make that commitment. It's not an option to, uh, I just owe too much to the people that came before me and the people coming after me to just to go hide out. So to the best of my ability, I, I'll keep saying what I feel I need to say and things will go as they go, you know. There's that verse in going down to sing in Texas. Um... I know I'm just a pilgrim. I'm only passing through. It's a choice I'm making, trying to be true. I don't know if there's a judgment day or a master plan, but I want to be ready if before the Lord I stand. I think the idea of being this uh, pilgrim, I mean, it's sort of the foundational myth of this country, right? Like these people who came to stand up for something they believe in, right? Except that those people then oppressed other people, you know? And then like, then people fought against that thing and then those people came in power and you know it's like this again the swinging back and forth of you know the puritans or whatever who felt this righteous need to have freedom in this country and then you know we have slave owners writing Water. the declaration of independence you know there's this foundational irony in in this country you know right to the root yeah well, we kind of have that everywhere. I, I pro I'm i sure if I dug around much, I'd find some foundational irony of myself that I'm not aware of and don't want to know about. <laughs> but you're right. Um, but the thing that I I think um, it's important to remember if you probably, you know, I'm not saying that you haven't, but I remind myself of when I get discouraged that things are such a mess and what I'm doing is just to drop in the bucket, which it is, I remember, you know, what's kept the whole thing from going all the way to crab, <laughs> going back to the Puritans and a thousand was that not everybody was doing that. There was always this percentage of folks that were countering that stuff. They mm -hmm. may not be written or rap about in large, you know, numbers in history, but those people have always been there and working on bending that arc. And so when I get discouraged, which is most hours of most days, <laughs> I remind myself of that, you know, we, all of us have to stay in there pushing back however we can. And that's folks that have done that in the past is why you and I are here talking right now. Right? right. We're free to do this right now. It's not an accident. It's because some folks stood up and didn't go, you know, hide off in the corner. And um, that's our job now. Not sure if the show on the road podcast would thrive in Russia right now, but you know, who knows? Yeah. Do you follow, um, you follow the, are you, you're familiar with Alexei and Navalny and yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I um, it's like the one year anniversary of the Ukrainian war, right? Right now, basically. I mean, it's, that sounds it's, about right. And, it's um, really in, insane that this country has been able to resist this massive power, foot stomping it. You know, it's it's an inspiring thing, but also just the level of trauma that these people are experiencing. You know, it's endless, and I feel like, you know, there's this helpless feeling not just Ukraine, but places all over the world where we're like, should we be doing something? Or it's not our responsibility to go in and and impose our moral 
sort of standing on various cultures, it's always that sort of push and pull. Um, and I feel like what you um, and John Prine, who obviously you worked with many times over your career, um, have given the world, I think, is the idea that I think the the working people, the the people in small towns who come from humble beginnings have humanity and, and a power to them. That These stories matter, you know? Um, I mean, the first song supposedly you ever fully wrote our town is maybe your most beloved and listened to song. Right. Um, does that feel strange all these years later that that song has had such a lasting uh, impact? Yeah. You know, you just, yeah, I, I, I don't remember thinking past that moment, really, when I wrote that song, but you said uh, my first song. So I wrote two songs the first week I started writing songs. I wrote two before Our Town, and I played one of them for my brother, and he said, oh, that's so-and-so's song. So I excelled like that. I had no consciousness, but I was like, oh, this one's great. Well, yeah, it was, and it wasn't mine. The other one I don't remember and then our town came so it really was but it really was my first song but i had wanted and been praying and hoping and trying to figure out how to get a song for you know a decade or more before that so um but as far as something coming together you know it was that song and i know i soon as i wrote that song and it came really really fast it, it was a like a spiritual moment for me i felt like somebody walked in the room and said iris this is what you're gonna do mm -hmm. and i'd been wondering since i was like 10 what i was gonna do and i was 30 i think when i was i 30 no i was 25, 25 i think when i wrote yeah. that thanks <laughs> i should fill you in on your own history here. more often right <laughs> it was 25 uh so I didn't think, oh boy, I wrote a hit. It, that never occurred to me. What I thought was, I'm going to be a songwriter and that seals that deal. And at that point, I didn't know how to play guitar. I, I didn't even know how to play the chords to the song. So I had a lot of figuring out to do, but I was absolutely assured that's what I was going to do. There was nothing that was going to stop me. And, you know, I haven't lost that. Um, uh, and your dream of creating the closing credits of Northern Exposure on CBS finally came true, you know? Well, I, uh, <laughs> it wasn't actually my dream. I'd never seen this show. I was out <laughs> working like all days of the year when Northern Exposure was on and I, I had heard about it, not seen it. Uh, and then of course I saw it when they played my, my song there. And that was, uh, they beautifully placed that, and that has helped me a lot. A lot of people became, between John Prine and Northern Exposure, Nancy Griffith, little boost from Merle Haggard, I, I managed to survive doing this. You know, I don't play big rooms. I don't sell records. Of course, now nobody sells records. You give your records away. Speaking of the corruption that should have our hair standing up on all of our heads. <laughs> Um, it has mine. You can't see it, but my hair is standing up on the inside. I'm really. You mean curious. you're not wealthy from the 10 million streams that our town has on Spotify right now? Do you know, it would take 120 million streams for me to just pay for what it, my record has cost me so far. 120 <laughs> million. But the guy, let's see, the Apple guy, let's just start with him. And they're the better payers of all. But the fellow who owns Apple, he made something like ninety nine point four million dollars last year, and some seven hundred fifty million, you know, stock buyout, whatever all their right. eight thousand ways of getting rich are. And that guy can't pay me more than point zero zero one cents. We should all just be out of our minds with rage, you know that we ran to the, the, you know, to vote every year. I did put my check in the box, you know, and those people went up there and they did this to me. Th these are the results of laws, right? These aren't just like weird little odd. Oh, how can it, you know, it's not a coincidence that 
we can be um that i'm and all artists are in this position now of giving their goods away well i think there's this double-edged what sword like of the beauty of the digital music discovery ecosystem right mm -hmm. which i benefit from every day i could lie to you and say that i don't use spotify all day which i do to find a lot of new artists that i play on my radio show or the podcast and yet my own songwriting you know in my touring band which has probably i think 15 million streams on spotify it's can barely get by yeah right yeah. and that's just like a fact financially yeah. you know now I think what people aren't talking about is that the playlisting world, right? It's passive listening, right? It's stuff that right. it's just on in the background. It's, it's something that you cursory glance at. Um, the people who are really devoted to an Iris Dement record will find you and support you. It's just like, I think we have to manage our expectations a lot more with the massive amount of art that is allowed to be in the world. And it's good that the art is allowed to be in the world. But it's also so much harder to find the people who are already working in the world, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of layers to this, but I want to see the 1% start managing their expectations. You know, Touché. we're always asked to manage our expectations, yeah, yeah. working people, you know, right. oh, you don't deserve a paid sick day. Oh, you don't deserve health care. Right. You know, uh, enough of that. Um. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm not anti-streaming. I'm anti, you know, corruption. And it's like... Well, it's like, why does the CEO yeah. of the company that is putting the music out need to make 100 million where we make 30,000? Like, it's, you know, it's like, <laughs> can there yeah. be some leveling of the score without being like communism? You know, it's like, there's yeah a tough They've balance to walk there. Phone and the brain... Yeah, I mean, they're buying the education system. You see what's going on with DeSantis, and that's going to spread, you know, if you, wow, you know, if you get control of the, the educational system and you just, uh, I think Hitler figured that out too, didn't he? Like, educate the young, and then they, you won't have protesters in the street. They won't, they won't have heard the stories. They won't know the history enough to counter you. And that's the direction we're headed really fast here. But obviously you're why very... I, thought I had to make this record. I, I probably should stop talking to you and get to work on the next one because there's a lot of work to be done. Well, you talk about obviously education um, and as a way, obviously, to lift people's consciousness. You is it true that you dropped out of high school and, and did, sort yeah. of moved to Midwest? I mean, like that must have been, you know obviously a, a whole journey, but like your education came from the places you worked, the, the people you met, right. Which kind of filters into your songs. Well, largely, you know, I, I made it through the 10th grade and then I, I left and I took the exam for the GED and somehow passed that. And then I went later on uh, some years later, I was probably 23. I went back to school for about a year and a half. And I'm glad I did. I was ready and and in, enjoyed that. In fact, I'm not sure I wouldn't have. I'm not sure I would have started writing had it not been for um, the teacher, my English literature, English 101, um, who really really encouraged me. Prior to that, I didn't know I had any talent. I'd wanted to be a writer when I was a kid, but I didn't ever get encouraged. And I also thought, if you can believe it, I came from such a sexist world that I thought, well, I'm a girl. <laughs> boys are supposed to write you know it seems crazy now but those messages were really powerful in my world um but yeah I went back and a this English literature teacher was so encouraging she would tell me I had good interesting ideas and I just went with it you know next thing you mm -hmm. know I was writing songs and I had faith that maybe I had something to say and then I couldn't stop but um and you released a, a record, um, trackless, the trackless woods in, in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, based on Russian poet Anna. 
Akhmatova. Akhmatova. Yeah. Sorry about that. I butchered no, that. No, some people say Akhmatova, and then I've had some Russian people say it's Akhmatova, but then I've heard some of them say Tova too, so I don't know. And my daughter's Russian, and her last name is, her birth name was Chesnikova, and they hmm. most definitely said Ova, so I'm a little not sure myself, but I've decided to go with the Akhmatova. How did you discover the work of that poet and, and want to devote yourself to that uh, album? Well, um, that originated with my daughter. My husband and I adopted our daughter when she was almost six from Siberia. She's almost 24 now. And uh, so, I mean, that was the entrance, you know, just being very interested in her and her culture and trying to understand, you know, the world that formed her a little bit better. And then uh, somebody had given me a book of poetry. It was... Um, a collection of poetry. In fact, it's sitting on my desk back there, a little book, um, Russian poets. And um, it was an old book. I think it might have come out like in the 40s even. But anyhow, one day I have to have that book for a year, two years, possibly. I opened it up. It was sitting on the piano and I opened it up. And I don't know. I just have had a number of these experiences in my life. And I opened it to Anna's poem, like a white stone and I read through it. I don't remember having any particular feeling about it, but uh, it was kind of like when our town came to me, I felt somebody walked in the room said, set that to music. I said, I don't know how. And they said, I'll help you. And, you know, five minutes later I had that song white stone and that's how that project went. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what these things are and I don't have some big mystical, I don't need, you know, I don't really even care anymore what the explanations are, but I do know I have things like that happen that feel rock solid, real, and I trust them and I go with them. And so far I've never been directed to do anything that was harmful to anyone. So I'm like, well, okay, let's write some songs together, you know, whatever, whoever you are. And that's how that proceeded. So I didn't know anything about her. And um, I just locked in and couldn't stop. And I think I took about a year off because I thought, well, this is insane. I have no business setting a Russian poet's songs, you know, to melody. What do I know about that? And I just couldn't stay away. And I kept coming back to it. And 18 songs later, um, there it is, Trackless Woods, which very few people bought <laughs> i don't care my husband's favorite record um oh my god my brain i just drew a blank oh my gosh i'm not gonna remember the the poet's name which is unbelievable it'll come back to me anyhow it's have you ever visited different. russia i went there two times um blake that was the poet he's he made a record of Blake songs and it's amazing and beautiful out of print. I'm like, it's just one of the best records I've ever heard. Um, I went there two times um, to visit my daughter the first time. And then the second time my husband and I went together to actually adopt her. So we uh, were in Moscow for a little while in uh, the dead of winter and Siberia um Sorry to say a little town, not a particularly little town, but a pretty beat down mining town in Kamarovo. Um, I would call it like central Siberia. Uh, getting, yeah, pretty, maybe a couple hundred miles north of the southern border. And, um, you know, a lot of beautiful, amazing people like there are everywhere that were struggling and bearing up under really even then really difficult circumstances and uh, there are warriors of love everywhere my daughter had a foster mom who was one of them and no one will ever know her name but she had virtually no resources and worked at the an orphanage devoted her life to that and taking care of little children my daughter was one of them and um it's a perfect segue into your song "Warriors of Love" off the new record. Yeah, yeah. Um, about her. Yeah. 
you know, yeah, these figures that I think we know, like uh, John Lewis or, or Rachel Corey, but people uh, like this person who saved your daughter from, um, you know, ruin yeah. in a way are equally well, definitely in her case, powerful, have... you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I try to, you know, one reason I wrote this record and some of those songs you're referencing, I mean, talking to you and thinking this just, I just felt my spirit brighten up because I needed to dwell on these kinds of people to get me through uh, mm -hmm. all of the, um, oh God, I'm trying to think of words that are, you can say in public about the characters we've been dealing with for a long time now, but, um, you know, um, John Lewis, I mean, at somewhere, and I remember the former president said some god awful, like, how can uh, any living, you know, anybody with any sort of soul or heart or eyes for that matter say something like that? And I remember make a little note to myself I have to write a song about John Lewis. And I'd been wanting to write a song about Rachel Corey for a long time, too. And I remember when she, I think I heard about her on, um, Oh, I know I did on Democracy Now, Amy Goodman's show, Democracy Now, years ago. And yeah, you know, you just make little notes in your head uh, for things that you feel you need to pursue and do. And then the time became right and they wound up in that song together. I mean, all the women in Iran right now who are, you know, sticking up for you know Something their freedom beautiful. and their and and they're just getting disappeared and 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 killed in the street. I think it it's hard to believe that something like that can keep happening in this time of you know we assume progress and prosperity and but the world is so vast right that yeah our you know relative safe existence in Iowa City or L.A. it's so different than what people are going through in different parts of the country and we get these little glimpses through the uh peephole of time you know the internet twitter yeah. you know it's like these little uh glimpses and then all of a sudden it's shut out and we move on to whatever other thing is happening we haven't talked about iran in the news in weeks and months maybe you know it's like we've already forgotten about it you know like what happened to these yeah women? we're yeah well, it's not an accident we've forgotten because, uh, you know, the news, the news cycle works that way. You know, it's again, as you know, it's all so geared towards profit. It's it's not profitable to stay with something until it gets corrected or addressed, you know. So on to the next topic. But um, and that, again, is where I feel like songs can be really powerful. And, and what you're doing is really powerful. You're sitting with something for a period of time and, you know, fleshing it out and passing that along to folks. So to me, all the counters to the machine are, they're just absolutely necessary. You know, I don't have a big audience, but I feel like anybody I can reach, it's just got to happen now, like more than ever, you know, you got to push back in any way you can and you know, hope, 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 hope. And uh, like you were talking about the women of Iran. I mean, we got to step up for these folks, you know, we may not be able to go over there and change their situation, but we can carry the mission and carry the commitment to righteousness, you know, to just to cut to the chase and justice. We can carry that in, you know, endless ways. You know, Vera with my daughter, that's how she did it. I'm doing it through my songs. You're doing it through your work and your band and whatever things, other things in your life you're involved in. It's so easy to get discouraged and feel like that doesn't matter. I do it all the time. I was discouraged yesterday. I'm like, throw my record out the window. I can't change. You know, I can't solve the big problems. <laughs> I get like that. But all of us together can maybe not be able to turn around, but we can keep it from falling down. But I think the funny thing also is that many people uh, may only know you initially from something like In Spite of Ourselves with John, yeah. which is such a, such a lighthearted kind of uh, 
little smirk of a song where <laughs> you're talking about, you know, him getting turned on by sniffing your undies, right? Yeah. And we're like, yeah, that's Iris Dement. That's what I know her from. She's the <laughs> the lady talking about undies with John Prine. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. That's her. That's that's what I know her from. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see that one coming. Um <laughs> John also, wrote song, Sam, <laughs> John also wrote Sam Stone, you know, um, which I'm sure you know, but yeah. yeah, um, yeah, we change. I remember when that call came through, um, John had just survived cancer. Mm-hmm. John told me he never thought he was, he never thought he was going to die, but a lot of the rest of us, you know, were concerned and for good reason. And I don't know how much you know, but he lost half his neck and he right. was possibly never going to sing again and so forth but anyhow he um he called me after that and asked me if i would um record that song with him that he had just written and i'm just of course you know it was like john back from the dead i've i would always say yes to john but especially a back from the dead john it's like right. he kept saying i think you share the lyrics i think you share the lyrics i'm like john i'll sing anything with you his wife Fiona got on the phone. You have to let me fax you. That was fax days. <laughs> and I didn't, I'll be honest, I paused. I, I didn't like see my future holding like lyrics like that. <laughs> like, are you real? Is this for real? Um, but we did it, and I would have not done that song with anybody but John. And then we went out and sang it, I don't know how many hundred times, and I it, it's been great. I'm I'm over that hurdle. <sighs> <laughs> how and did you first how did you first him. meet him or how, how did he first John? encounter your work well when i was making my first record um my friend jim rooney produced it who co-produced this one he was one of counting me there were four of us on this because it was never going to be a record i just kept going in to record songs with people right and the next thing you know it's like wow i got something that's looking like a record but um So uh, he and I did Infamous Angel together and he had a demo of it and he knew John and nobody knew me. I had never even done a show. I had, I'd yet, I had only stood up and sang like in front of like open mic people, you know, and sang Mm -hmm. like songs. So I had this record. So anyhow, he, he knew John. So he asked John if he'd listened to the demo and if he liked it, would he say something? And so that's how that all started. John liked it. He cried into his pork chops and wrote a story about crying into his pork chops. And it did me a world of good. A lot of people listened to my record because he told them to. So, and then we continued um, almost immediately. He started taking me out to open for him. And I worked with John until, you know, to the end. I'd always, I did a lot of tours with him. We recorded, I don't know, half dozen duets sang him every night and I I would go out and open for him even those last years a couple times a year and and uh yeah that was that was a great loss to everyone I mean you've been able to team up with some you know legendary folks obviously you know uh Steve Earle who I was able to talk to in this show as well um um Amy Lou Harris you co-wrote a song with Merle Haggard. Do you feel like um, your songwriting brain is different when you are collaborating with someone versus writing for yourself? Yeah, I've done almost no collaboration. This is the first record. Um, you know, my first husband, and I, who's not musical at all, he 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 says I'm not putting words in his mouth. You know, we did the kind of thing in the car, you know, we might come up with a title together and you know, we, we weren't, I, I didn't, I've just not really co-written. Um, and the song I did with Merle, uh, I was out working with him, touring with him. I still can't quite believe it. He asked me to play the piano for him in The Strangers. So I went out in the and did that for six or eight weeks, I guess, but while we were out there, I had a song, uh, this kind of happy with you, but I didn't feel it was finished. And I came in on the bus and asked him if he would like to help me. He instantly had a bridge. So I have, I think what I'm coming around to saying is I never had to sit in a room, you know, uh-huh. figure this out. Um, 
but these this record is different though i did co-write two songs with pieta pieta brown and those were um more like maybe the traditional kind of co-writing that when we think of co-writing we think of i don't know I mean, is there any traditional co-writing but yeah we we were equally you know involved in both of those songs so um the sacred now being one that you wrote with yep, her yeah and i won't ask you why yeah we definitely we did those together and i don't think i've ever i think that's it i've done i haven't co-written uh, apart from that so back to your question i um I don't know what it is. I you said at the beginning of the show, you know, the family of fourteen, and I think there's something in there for me. Like I'm just, I've done my sharing here. <laughs> yeah, my son. I just felt from the get go with my songs want to be my songs. I want this to be something that's me, me, me. Uh, I feel that maybe a little bit less, which is why I was so op- able to be open to Pieta, but I'm also really close with Pieta. So it was a different sort of a, um, you know, an experience and undertaking, but yeah, I, I just wanted something that wasn't the church telling me what they thought and what they thought I should do, or, you know, share the, you know, I, I'm not complaining about having to share as a child. Don't get me wrong. I learned a lot from that. I'm grateful for that, but my music, I just, um, I want it to be my outlet for, whatever my unique expression was and i i'm happy i did that you know for better or worse it's it, i think um, the uh the beautiful thing about uh bonnie Raitt's sort of shocking win at the grammys this year i don't know if you saw that where she beat out beyonce and uh, oh, you know. I didn't know that. I knew she, I didn't watch that. I knew she won some awards and was happy. She won, her. I want to say rec- record of the year, like or song of the year, I think. Okay. You know? And she, oh. the look on her face was just, she was like, I'm sorry, what? You know? Yeah. And, yeah. but uh, again, when you look at what pop music is, and I think it is its own incredible art form. It's just that all of that is this machine of people creating this massive consumerist product that can go out there uh and be obviously loved by a lot of people but also be in commercials and movies and soundtracks whereas bonnie Raitt won and she wrote that song herself yeah which was almost an unheard of thing to be in a a top category at the big fancy award show it's like no this one woman wrote one song and all of a sudden she's on stage going oh my gosh you know People yeah. still honor this every now and again, you know, which is what I think folk music Americana. It's like still a songwriter's medium, which I think is important. You know, I also sort of uh, struggle with the fact that like, yes, you're supposed to want to collaborate with your peers or bigger people than you to try to get your music heard mm-hmm. or have it be uh, polished in a brighter way. And I'm like, yes, but I have so many songs that I want people to hear from me. Right. Stay with it. <laughs> like Be I want you to hear I my song. Great. I don't want you to hear this <laughs> and this and this person's song. You know, it's yeah. so hard to just get anything heard that is from within you. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that that is maybe why I value something that you do and have been able to do so much because when someone hears you sing, uh, whether it's our town or, uh, you know, something like sacred now, they know it's you from the moment the first note comes out. It's, it's, it's you. It can only be Iris Dement, Right. And maybe that's because you have a, a unique voice in a, in a, a way you can uh, relay lyric. But I think, the singularity of, of what you're creating is, is, is important. And, um, you know, do you see yourself being able to tour 10 years from now, or do you feel like you want to, you know, sort of slow down eventually? Well, you know, I've been, I fall into that category where I've, where I've been able to work for a lot of years now and, you know, my agents told me a number of times, you know, he's over the years, I've been with him for the better part of 30 years. He's booked a lot of people with big hits who like, 
a year after their big hit, he couldn't get him a gig, even in the small rooms. <laughs> play in. So when I, when I apologized to him, cause I like him so much. I don't, I I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm paying my bills. I'm going to be fine, but I like him so much. I want him to get <laughs> the big money from me. Like, Oh, Kevin, I'm sorry. But he reminds me of that, that it's still relatively unique to be able to maintain mm -hmm. a level that you can survive, you know. So I have a small but loyal following. And I don't know, I'm 62, so I'm guessing I can stay at it for, I don't know. I mean, assuming all my fans don't die, I mean... <laughs> get some of your younger folks start coming to my shows the the end could be i could be 100 i don't know i don't know i don't think about that i'll keep playing as long as i'm able to and want to and feel like i'm contributing and somebody shows up i don't have the kind of following if i have one regret i don't have the kind of following that affords me the luxury of being able to go out with a band and i love musicians i love playing with other play i just think that's the most amazing wonderful thing to stand there and have three fabulous people that are just absolutely talented what they're doing compliment your song for us to work together on this thing to deliver to the the people i haven't been able to do that but the trade-off for me would have meant i would have had to write a lot more than i'm capable of in other words i can't write the kind of songs i want to write and at that at that volume so i would have had to compromise there you know what i mean so, you feel like there was a show uh, a moment in time where you had like your biggest rock star moment like the biggest audience the most intense show that you can ever remember we were like i can't believe i'm here a show show um well, uh, this wasn't actually my audience, but I'll take it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it was Glastonbury, and oh, wow. I it's the Glastonbury Festival, and I think it was '96, right around in there. I mean, it was just a sea of people, as far as I could see. Which really, honestly, that didn't do anything for me. I, I would rather see some, you know, a handful of people I could make out rather than the sea of people. But the high of that was. Johnny Cash went on after me and I stood in the wings. I still can't believe that happened. Mm. I stood like 10 feet away and I watched Johnny Cash and June Carter mm. do their show and, uh, you know, snapped photos. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know your history with Johnny Cash, but uh, I mean, I was a kid and Johnny Cash, he, he was just bigger than life. And, really touched me deeply and there he was and I had played there I didn't make any sense so I mean again that was not my audience I'm sure a handful of folks were there to see me but um that was pretty extraordinary yeah it's epic but other than that it could be any night it could be a room I've been in rooms with a spattering of people I walk out and be like oh damn nobody can and had the most amazing time and felt mm -hmm. like the universe just couldn't have gone on without that evening that happens. And so I just stay ready for that at any time. Ready. Yeah. I, I tour the, the band that I have Dust Bowl revival. We have always been a large group, seven, eight pieces. Okay. With horn section, which is why we are rolling in money, but the, um, well, you must have a decent audience if you can even like, why well, breakfast lunch, and dinner with seven eight people but i think i've become used to being <laughs> financially irresponsible enough where we can just do this that's just like this is the sound i want it's like a new orleans meets oh. folk music thing where are and you at did you say la earlier yeah I, yeah we're based in la oh i want to um, see you see you all that's um, blue revival okay you know i ironically we did i see book a concert series in iowa in july but I don't know where in Iowa, but we, well, we made played Iowa like once. Maybe. If I go there, I'll see it. Yeah. Yes. I don't think it's posted oh. yet, but, okay. um, well, but I'm we've fine. been around for over 10 years and uh -huh. um, the sadness, I think that I feel sometimes where 
you feel like you gained an audience and then you lost an audience and then you gained an audience and then you lost an audience, yeah. especially from the pandemic. It's like you couldn't keep up any sort of momentum. Um, it's like this, it's always there. And we're, you know, like we're going to Colorado next week and you always get the the little message from your manager being like, well, uh, you know, Steamboat Springs and Denver are doing okay, but boy, Colorado Springs and Fort Collins on Wednesday and Thursday. <laughs> um, I don't take those calls. <laughs> and I'm always like, why do you have to tell me though? You know, but it's, it's, I feel for these venues too. It's like, yeah. they booked us thinking like, wow, they seem like a fun group who've played all around Colorado before. And for whatever reason, <laughs> The, the niche in those towns on those nights just do not care for what we're doing uh-huh. or they're just like well we'll go to denver we're not gonna go to colorado springs <laughs> you know but, yeah. but it's like we can't never play these other towns you know and you have to build out these tours and it's this constant yeah. struggle i think with a lot of medium-sized bands where you're like who's gonna come on the wednesday night somebody yeah. has to come and the debate is like well should we cancel the show or and they're like ah no, go ahead and do it anyway. And then it's like, is it going to be humiliating or will it be one of those shows? Sometimes you remember those shows where 20 people yeah. show up in a 500 capacity room. Oh, and yeah. yet those people are so pumped that you're there that it's more special than when 500 people show up and they are just talking and looking at their phones. You know, that's true. Yeah, I saw Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys in a little club in Nashville middle of the week spattering of people i mean way <laughs> really yes i did and they did you did tell people it. he was the father of bluegrass no he was too busy telling people <laughs> that so he didn't <laughs> you know I, I and that was before i started you know making records and doing this and it was just a little note to self like that was a really meaningful night to me and they they did their show you know, they put their powder blue suits on and they did their show. And, and I mean, he was an old guy then. <laughs> did the show. I don't know. I don't know. That's tough. It's can be really hard on the ego. But I don't know. That's when you just got to really be sure you love what you're doing and put all that aside. Is there someone from back in history, a songwriter, uh, a singer that you wish you could have done a duet with no it's funny people ask the that sort of thing often and i always think what's wrong with me i don't have dreams like that um i wanted to meet merle haggard who who just you know had a major impact on my life as a child and you know i mean i we could talk a lot about that but he you know he was like my just to, he was an idol for me, you know, musically, he had a big impression on me. And the first time I heard a Merle Haggard song, my brother was playing the guitar and piano, right? Not piano, piano guitar, and writing songs. And I heard mama tried and I thought my brother wrote it. I remember thinking, wow, Glenn's getting really good. I'm like eight years <laughs> old. And then I heard this guy Merle on the radio. And that, that was my entrance into, you know, Merle world. And yeah. I remember walking around the streets of Reading when we went on vacation once when I was a kid looking for this Merle fellow. And this was all pre-Google and internet and all that stuff. So right. you kind of just had to imagine from a record cover what somebody looked like and piece together. Like, you know, you just couldn't go scour and find out everything, you know, that all this crap we really don't need to know. You couldn't find it out. And then I met him and got to know him for a for, for stretch of time. Uh, I actually made him chicken. He he and the strangers came to my house and I made them chicken dinner and I was not very good at it. And <laughs> let's do when the forks went in the chicken. So I just got back to trying to sing and write songs. But um, after that, I didn't have that thing going in me anymore, you know, because for me, like, you know, once I met somebody that I'd idolized and and had you know the the things that played out in that relationship that I'm grateful for, and I and you realize these people are also just really ordinary human beings. Right. I got over that. I think from then on, I just always separated the two. 
and mm. I felt really appreciative of the work that some that someone has brought and offered to me. And I haven't really had that need to meet the person since singing. Ah, man, I got to sing with Merle Haggard and John Prine and pretty good. You know, I, I don't know. I just I don't really have like a wish list. So just put on your fantasy hat real <laughs> quick. You're at Glastonbury. You go back in time. You're at Glastonbury. Johnny Cash looks over at you side stage and he's like, mm, do you want to come and sing with me in June uh-huh. on what Johnny Cash song? What Johnny mm-hmm. Cash song? Yeah. Oh, I would have taken. Um, I would have. Well, if June stayed on stage, if June would agree to leave, it would have been Jackson. All right. Got married in a fever. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> June, well, I don't uh, I think that went through. But... I'm really glad that you're still at it and and better than ever. And um, I'm, you know, I'm trying. Yeah. I think I think what you're doing is important, you know, and I think it's a uh, the the warriors of love need to keep pushing the love into the into the light. Otherwise, the darkness wins. Yeah. You know, one thing I think is important to remember about that is sometimes it takes an awful lot of anger to access your love. Mm. I think we seem to think uh, there's a lot of pressure to like to think of love as this smiley, you know, mm. I don't know what the other adjectives would be to go with that, but I, if just to be honest, this record that I think has got a lot of love in it came from a lot of rage and a lot of despair. Mm. I think it's important to remember that all these pieces go together (laughs) and to, um, I don't know, there's just a lot of pressure to squelch that. And I, I think a lot of good comes from, righteous indignation i maybe is what i'm looking for is that the right term righteous indignation yeah. um you know i mean i i've mentioned that verse <laughs> jesus you know he went into the temple and he he knocked the tables off you know the picture i would mm-hmm. see as a kid which always of course grabbed my child imagination was jesus with his hair flying and the ropes going and the tables flying I don't know if you ever saw that one, but it was in a lot of our children's Bible literature. It's just very vivid in my mind. And it's like, oh, that's God too, you know? Like um, sometimes things, you know, need to get dealt with. And um, well, you have that that sequence yeah. in how, how long, right? Where it's like uh, justice rolls down like water and righteousness flows like that mighty stream it, you need the righteousness to clean yeah. the slate yeah that's a good way to put it yeah yeah you got to use the anger you know um i don't know i'm still figuring it out myself but um if people don't rise up in anger you know to protest what progress really comes recently you know it's like people getting in the street and actually saying this is not okay yeah forces people to the table to the negotiating table yeah and i think the thing that's painful to to think about is if we don't do it who's going to you know yeah it's really easy to fall into this so somebody else will come along some great leader that knows how to phrase things just perfectly i deal with that all the time i'm like i don't know how to talk about this stuff and i some of it is to get into the fight. You have to put your ego aside and bring what you got and stop worrying about what to, you don't got. You know, if you're entrenched in your ego, you can't do that because you're going to look stupid. I, yeah. I go around looking stupid all the time. Every time I go to a show, I go home at night. And I'm like, I know I looked really stupid, but I gave what I had for the greater cause. Mm. Like, if I'm not willing to look stupid, who gets hurt from that? Who are the people on the bottom that are getting crushed? Mm. You know, I, 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 it's important. That I, I'm talking to myself on this to be willing to look stupid, to put something good out in the world, you know? Amen. That, that sounded a little odd, but I, yeah, there's something important in there.
Well, I think being able to put um, your own story and your own hardship, your own uh, experiences out there, you have to have a lack of shame in a way, right? You have to be able to read your diary in front of a live audience sometimes. You know? Well, you have to care about something bigger than you, as I said yeah. in that song. You know, I mean... I'll be gone relatively, you know, I'm not young. I've got a time as my husband, Greg Brad put one his he has a tiny little future and a great big past. Well, I have more of a future, I think, than him, I'm a little bit younger, but <laughs> no, I I hope that the larger share of what I've offered is value and some of the stuff I get wrong, uh, you know, hopefully it'll it won't, I don't know. <laughs> it'll be out there too. But um that's just all part of it. Well, thanks uh, for getting on with me. I really appreciate the conversation. Oh, I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. So I'm going to well, be looking for you. I got your band name down here and um, Iowa. Yeah, I'll I'll see if you if yeah, I'm in like, town. Here, I think it's called Lakeview, Iowa. Lakeview. It's called the. <clears throat> the stone pier summer concert series okay lakeview iowa the historic stone pier stage a soul-filled celebration of independence july 1st uh-oh gotta celebrate our independence it looks like <laughs> i have a thing or two to say about that won't you <laughs> celebrate getting independent yeah well are you coming out to la anytime soon um I don't think I have anything scheduled, but I'm sure that that will be on the books before long. Yeah, now that you say that, I don't. That hasn't happened yet. That's we got to get to work on that. Hollywood okay, Bowl, Northern show. California. <laughs> yeah, the Hollywood Bowl. Me and you. <laughs> yeah. In the front parking lot. <laughs> yeah. So. I'll look out for it. Yeah. All right. We'll keep up the good work. You too. All right. Well, I sure enjoyed talking to you and I loved your backdrop. Are these coaches <laughs> back here? The uh, gold. It's the, it's the, you know, the, the $5 sequin curtain back there. I love that. Yeah. What part of LA are you in? Uh, Santa oh. Monica, right by uh, McCabe's guitar shop. Which I'm oh, you are. Lucky yeah. you. Yeah. I played there a number of times. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll be back there. Yeah. I'm playing a, a set there in, I think, on St. Patrick's Day. Ah. Oh. I could actually walk to a show. That's never happened. Yeah. Have you lived there very long? Is that your, been your home for a um, while? I've been in, me and my wife have been here about five years, but I've been in LA over, what, 12, 13 years now? I'm from Chicago yeah. originally, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's, LA is home now, more Good. or less, you know. I try so to defend it against all haters, it. but. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks yeah. so much for taking time. All right. Well, I'll yeah, be... we'll we'll, uh, we'll let you guys know when when this comes out in the next month or so. Yeah. Um. Do you have my email or little? Te oh, uh, you'll let Karen know. Okay. I got yeah, you. Karen. Karen's on the email with me. Yeah. Um, well. Um. Yeah, I'll be watching for you. Very good. Okay. You take Thanks care. Yeah. Right, thank bye -bye. you. Bye.